Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I want to talk about uh, writing advice, narrative advice, that I, I came across a video, I'm not going to mention the video because I disagree with a lot of what this person was saying, but they offered five tips of, uh, or they identified five things that audiences really don't enjoy in narrative. Um, and this goes for readers as well as viewers, be it of TV, film, or uh, readers of books. And they offered these five points. And I found myself arguing with the video. And when this happens, it's, it's usually a sign that, yeah, let, let, let's talk about this. So their, their first point was that uh, audiences hit when you mix genres. And you need to signal very early on what the genres are. Otherwise, audiences will hit it. And this, this is incomplete advice because mixing genres is absolutely fine. And you don't need to signal very early on what each of the different genres are going to be. What you need to be aware of is the types of genres that you're mixing and whether or not the intended audience is going to overlap for those genres. So for instance, they give the, they give the example of a romance and this man and a woman, they meet, they go on a date, they have this wonderful time. And just as they're sitting in a cafe and they're about to kiss for the very first time, the man is killed by a sniper and it's suddenly a thriller action movie. That could work perfectly well if it was set up, but what is the audience for that? What audience are you aiming at that wants the first half of a story to be a romance and the second half to be an action spy thriller adventure? One of the examples of like really good genre mixing was from Dust Till Dawn, uh, Quentin Tarantino. And in that movie, Spoilers for the movie. It happened. It was, was years ago, but it starts out as a sort of Tarantino-esque, hyper-realist crime, kidnapping sort of actiony type movie. Then there's a turning point in the middle of the movie when it becomes a horror comedy, um, because everyone turns into vampires. And there's a turning point right in the movie when it suddenly just jumps genres. But the thing is, there's a significant overlap in the intended audience for that. A lot of the audience of Tarantino's movies will enjoy both. Therefore, the transition from one genre into a radically different genre is going to work. The audience is going to be appreciative of both genres. We see a lot of genre bending and genre blending with science fiction and fantasy, because it's not that it, these things are concrete boxes that quite often they operate on a spectrum of um, assumed levels of rationality, assumed levels of mimesis, whether there are explanations given for some things, all of these different elements. So while I understand advertising what the genres are very early on sets audience expectations, that to me isn't particularly good advice. That's just telegraphing what your story is. From a crafting perspective, I think it's far more useful to actually think about the genres of your story, if you're writing in genre, what the intended audience has in terms of expectation and enjoyment. Who are you pitching the story to? Is there an overlap between the various elements that you're putting together? Because genre blending, using ideas from different genres or tropes from different genres, can be a great way to create originality in your work. But you don't just mash them together stupidly, as in the example that this person gave, because that, that was ludicrous. So the, the advice on this one, I think, is be aware of audience expectations. Be aware of what your intended audience wants to see in a story, the overlap between genres. Are they very far apart? Romance, um, soft, gentle romance versus spy thriller. 
You can certainly do a romantic spy movie. Um, you can do a comedy action spy movie with romance elements. All of these things can happen, but you just have to be aware of how you're blending them. And you don't just put two different stories together and expect the transition to be fine. The next was they referred to inconsistent pacing. And before I even listened to the point, I had to stop because by definition, pacing should not be monotonous. And therefore, you, you don't want you don't want to use the term inconsistent. Pacing shouldn't be the same all the way through. There should be variation. And when they went through to discuss their point, what they meant was don't start fast, then have a really long, slow section in the middle, and then suddenly ramp up the end. What they mean is be aware of how your story is paced. Be aware of when you've had a breathless section that people have rushed through, that they might now need a breather, they need to relax. But if you draw that section out too long, people can become bored. It's be aware of pacing. It's not about consistency or inconsistency in pacing. It's being aware of the movement and speed of the narrative, the narrative events. And where you have slower sections, you don't necessarily need to intercut them with action to alter pacing. That's one way of doing it. You can change sentence lengths to reflect changes in, in motion and movement because that gives the reader a sense of speeding up. But also you can ratchet up tension. Um, you can change the atmosphere and have increasing levels of dread. So it's a slow section, but the dread is slowly building. If you are altering pacing, remember that pacing is not a separate element to content. How a story is told and what is being told are related. So pacing and content should be a package where one is supporting the other. And I think that is a, a much more useful way of approaching this instead of thinking about it mechanically of, I want a fast section, I want a slow section. It's thinking about it in terms of how your reader is progressing through it or how your viewer is approaching the movie. And how long have you drawn out this section? How has it slowed down? Do we need more action here? Do we need more emotion here? Do we need more dread? Do we need something to energize it a bit? Because each of those different elements can be used in different ways to alter the perception of the reader, to um, entice reader engagement. It's not just about the mechanics of pacing, it's about content as well. Their next point was about unnecessary recaps. And again, I had to stop here because by definition, if the recap is unnecessary, it's bad. What they went on to describe is when an author basically stops forward momentum in um, presumably a plot-driven story to recap previous sections and does it for a whole chapter, multiple chapters, where they're just retreading ground from before, uh, from before, repetition. You go, right, fine. Like, of course that's going to be bad. But recaps by definition aren't bad. If it is unnecessary, yes, then it is bad. Because why would it be unnecessary? Because your reader already knows this. Your reader has already retained this. So. Personally, I think better advice in this is to be, again, aware of your audience. Be aware of your intended audience and their ability to retain information. How heavily signaled was this information earlier? Was it overtly stated, in which case it, it should be knowledge that they have in the back of their head? But as a rule of thumb, the younger the intended audience, the more complex the information the more likely you are to have to find different ways to recap, to reintroduce or reiterate information that was previously given. Conversely, the older your audience or the less complex the information, the less likely you are to have to recap or remind your audience of the information they've already received. Again, audience awareness is much more useful than don't do recaps or don't use unnecessary recaps. That's like saying don't use gratuitous violence. By definition, if it is gratuitous, it's unnecessary. So 
Moving on. They then went on to describe pulling punches. And um, what, they, what they actually described was narrative contrivances. While they used the term pulling punches, you go, that's not what that term means. But anyway, what they described were narrative contrivances when the plot has dictated an outcome and the writer has written themselves into a corner where they can't think of a believable reason why that outcome has occurred. So the example they gave was a villain who is this amazing sniper who never misses and has killed all of these different people first time. And then when they go to aim at the hero, they miss several shots in a row for ridiculous reasons. And again, ridiculous reasons are usually bad. Well, depending on the genre, you could have, you know, Terry Pratchett does it very well, but that's writing in comedy. What this is actually more about, and it is good advice, is always be aware of the psychological realism or the psychology and motivations of all the characters, not just the hero character. And if plot is dictating to you what must happen and it doesn't fit with character motivation or where the character is, that can create a dissonance in your readership. Instead of using plot contrivances, if a no-win scenario has been created, that the hero needs to get out of something, and you cannot think of a believable way to do this, then stop, look at that situation and go, how can I alter the situation so that it isn't, it still appears to be a no win, but there is a believable way out. That's the key. It's not about pulling punches. That's not what the term means. It's about narrative contrivances. And instead of just blithely letting plot dictate action, thinking about how you can use character motivation, character psychology to push it forward, to find solutions to problems. The last thing that this person talked about was cliffhanger, en cliffhanger endings with no solution. This is bad. You must have a resolution. And in narrative theory and literary theory, we we, it's not about cliffhanger endings. It's about providing closure. Closure is this sense of where the major elements of a story have been closed off, where there is a resolution to the major elements. It has nothing to do with whether or not there is a cliffhanger about different elements or there are certain plot threads that have not been neatly closed off at the end. If the vast majority of the major thrust of the narrative has reached resolution, that is usually enough to provide closure to a reader. Um, they give the example of uh, one of the Batman movies in which Batman resolves the majority of the story by getting rid of the Joker. But then there's a cliffhanger. He's being pursued by the police. But that's a separate story. That's setting up the next story or a different story. There is closure and resolution to the main narrative, which is the confrontation with the Joker. So what this is actually about, it, it, very little to do with cliffhangers. It's the concept of closure and, again, paying attention to what effect you're trying to generate in a reader or in a viewer. Think of the film Inception. Inception ends on a clearly ambiguous ending about did the character find the result that they wanted or is it all a dream? Is it all still a fabrication? And that's left unresolved at the end. And people argue about it endlessly. But if you think of the major aspects of the narrative, the entire heist, that was resolved. All of these things happened. We followed through the action. There was a resolution for the main things. It's a zinger on the end to leave something unresolved that this character may or may not have the full resolution of their arc. And the thing is, that has been done very deliberately to create that ambiguous ending, to create people to argue about it, because it isn't resolved. It isn't intended to be resolved. And again, a lot of this here is about understanding closure for the main elements and the effect that you're trying to generate in a reader or a viewer. 
if you want that at the end, the reader to feel dissatisfied. If you want to create, oh, none of the things have been answered. Know that that's going to happen. Certain readers and viewers will want certainty at the end and they will not enjoy everything being left up in the air or the majority of things being left up in the air or even certain plot threads, minor plot threads being left up in the air. They will want complete resolution of every single plot thread. So if you're not going to do that, be aware that some people are going to be dissatisfied. As long as you provide the majority of closure for the majority of the narrative, the majority of your readership or viewership will appreciate that. And that, I think, is a much better way of approaching this than going, oh, with cliffhangers, um, yeah, this is about cliffhangers. It's not about cliffhangers. It's about resolution and closure of the narrative. And closure is a well-established concept. But anyway, this, this video was simply because a lot of people give writing advice. A lot of people talk about the rules of writing. And yet, rules without understanding context are rarely useful. Understanding who your audience is, understanding what type of narrative that you are trying to communicate, understanding the effects that you are generating in your audience, and understanding that all the different elements of narrative work together. These are principles that if you're aware of those things, then you're more likely to craft a successful, interesting narrative than if you just rigidly apply rules and go, oh, well, cliffhangers, you, you must provide resolution. No, you don't. It depends on the effect that you want to create. Oh, well, you can't have narratively contrived situ situations because that's pulling a punch. You no, overly contrived situations, again, overly, are bad because it's too much. It's going to disrupt the suspension of disbelief. This willing suspension of disbelief is important in narratives that we try to immerse ourselves in. But again, it depends on the effect that you're trying to achieve. There's a great sequence in one of the Austin Power movies where Dr. Evil says, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to put him in this torture chamber. And of course, Seth Green, the character who plays Dr. Evil's son, is like, no, but I can just go and get my gun and we can shoot him now. Playing up to that trope because it was comedy, it was parody. Understanding that is more important than applying the rule. It's the same with recaps. The reiteration, reintegration, or reminders of information in a text is going to depend on the complexity of the text, the age and retention of the reader, your estimation of their ability to retain that information. All of that is important and is good to be aware of. And it's whether or not you're trying to create the effect of the feeling of putting the pieces together and it's a revelation for a certain percentage of your readership. Or if you want to have one of those big reveals, like the montage sequence at the end where the detective reveals everything and we see how it all actually happened. There are so many different ways to do it that the key word here is unnecessary recaps. If it's unnecessary, then why is it there? Necessary recaps are fine because they are necessary for the narrative. So again, it's it's talking about these things, but trying to be sensible about how we talk about them. Consistent pacing. You don't want your pacing to be consistent all the way through unless you're trying to produce something that is breathless all the way through or slow all the way through because you are aware that usually variance in pacing is a technique you can use to spike reader engagement, to give them a breather from a breathless section. Being aware of pacing and having pacing fit, match the, the content of your narrative is far more important than some rule about when you have things fast and when you have things slow. Awareness of pacing is the big thing and knowing that pacing is related to content. And it is only one factor because you can use atmosphere. 
you can use tone, you can use style, you can use character moments, like all of these different things can be used to manipulate the reader to create engagement or create interest in a slower section, just as it can be done in a fast paced section. There are different techniques that you can use. So it's not about don't have it very fast, very slow, very fast. That, that's overly reductive. Those things can happen. You can have a slower start to ramp up. All of these are different styles, different techniques. They suit different narratives. And the last one, again, like mixing genres, mix genres, but be aware of the genres you're mixing. Be aware of the different elements and be aware of the intended audience for your story. That, that is the big thing because you can do wild and crazy things with mixing genre. You don't need to telegraph very early on. The closer genres are together, the more likely you are to get away with mixing them because your intended audience may be the intended audience for both. The further apart they are, the more groundwork and foundational work you might need to do to ensure that you are your audience is the correct audience, that your narrative has found the audience it's intended for, rather than an audience expecting a beautiful, soft, quiet romance, and then suddenly being in the born identity. Or an audience that's expecting the born identity, and it's all about the remains of the day. Mixing genres. It's not about telegraphing early. It's about ensuring that your narrative is meeting uh, or is finding the correct audience. And if it's very, very niche, that's the audience that you want to reach. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support and I'll see you in the next one.